That's good. In 1964, 50 years ago, folks, 50 years, I graduated from high school. And I was thinking about these kids up here this morning. We've got five of them graduating, three going off into the military. And I thought to myself how fast that 50 years went by. Because I remember when I was 17, just like it was yesterday. I can't remember yesterday, but I can remember when I was 50 years ago. <laughs> Amen. All right. If you have your Bible, would you turn the book of Hebrews with me, please? Chapter number 11. Hebrews chapter number 11 and verse number 1. Hebrews. I'll say this, I'll say this very quickly to all of you this morning. I love the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is a powerful book. Hebrews chapter number 11 and verse number 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtain a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Father, bless your holy word now. In thy holy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. There are three things that I exist and the human mind is hardly able to comprehend that which is holy, that which is spiritual, and that which is eternal. And all three of these things bear witness to the Word of God. Or let's say this, the Word of God bears witness to them. That which is holy, that which is spiritual, and that which is eternal. The 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews deals with the holiness of God. It deals with the spiritual nature of God, and it deals with the eternity that God dwells in. The book of Hebrews is the faith chapter, well known by anyone who has read the Scripture, studied the Word of God. When someone says faith, you immediately go to the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. The word faith is a powerful thing. Faith is able to do something that nothing else can. You either have faith or you don't have faith. As was illustrated in our Sunday school this morning, one of our teachers held a jar of mustard. That, of course, is reference to a mustard seed. I remember one of my trips to the Holy Land. Our guide showed us a mustard seed. And you have to look very carefully to be able to see it because it's small. And our Lord Jesus Christ said, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be thou removed. And so therefore faith is a mysterious thing, but it's a powerful thing. It's the kind of thing that can transform your life this day. You might have walked into this house this morning weak in your faith, but when you leave today by the grace of God, you may be strengthened in your faith. Faith therefore is either something you have or do not have. Faith is not something you can create. It is not in your ability to manufacture it, fabricate it, create it, call it into existence. It doesn't work that way. The only way that you'll ever have faith is for God to give you faith. The Word of God is the very seed of faith. The Bible that I'm preaching to you today is God's Word. And it is able and capable, fully capable, of producing faith in the heart of someone who has none. Therefore, if you have no faith today, I adjure you to cry out to the one that can give you faith. Call on his name. He said in, in the book of uh, Deuteronomy 33, 3, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. So the Bible teaches us that faith is something that we absolutely must have or we cannot 
please God. Faith in the character of God. Faith in God's name. Faith in in God's providence. Faith in God's purpose. Faith in God's reason. Faith in God's will. Faith in God's mind. Faith in the fact that there is one that is infinitely greater than you are. Infinitely capable of more than your mind can even conceive. There are those that are bound up and locked into us. Locked as might, might as well be locked in prison because they can go no higher than their intellect. They judge God by their measly little pitiful mind. They hold everything. If they can't understand it, it doesn't exist. But my friend, there's more going on in your body right now than any physician that's ever lived can understand. There's more going on right now in this world spiritually that no human being is capable of even comprehending what's happening. I remember the statements that Einstein made. And I use him as an illustration because he is one of the most brilliant men that ever walked the face of this earth. And Einstein said this. He said, I guess that it is less than 1% of 10%. In plainer words, something like 1% of what we understand doesn't even begin to touch the vast majority of the information that's available out there for humanity to even be comprehend or understand what's going on. And Einstein also said this. He said, I want to know where light comes from. He want to know why you breathe. What's water about? What's going on with this dog? What am I standing on? The air that I breathe, where I am. He said, my mind is constantly searching, reaching out, grabbing, trying to comprehend. He said, all of this that's in front of me, all of this vast creation was made by Almighty God. And he said, here I am on this stage and I'm watching all of this. I'm trying to figure out. He said, my mind explodes all the time in trying to take in everything in front of me so you're dull so you're boring so you sit with your head between your legs so you think you know it all you know nothing I to be honest with you today let me be charitable you're ignorant as you can be and so am I Except for the word of God and what God reveals to us, we know nothing. We're no more than a dog. But when God opens his word and begins to speak to us, the earth opens up. The universe rolls back. Eternity unfolds before us. We begin to see beyond what we are. And our faith is able to take us into places that our mind cannot comprehend. Our faith can walk into holy places that angels fear to tread. Our faith can reach up and take Take hold of God in a way that nothing else can because God put his very essence in you. That's why he said you're made in the image of God. He gave you access to him that nothing else has. And when we think about the fact that God has been so good to us and blessed us and yet we sit around bored. We're bored. We're bored. And so you turn on the television and you sit there and you let this thing feed you, feed you. And you sit there in a passive state and you get to the point to where you can't even think anymore. So all you do is every time you go into the house, push the button and sit there in front of the TV and you think you can think. You quit thinking a long time ago. The TV thinks for you. Why don't you watch that little bird and see how it flies? Watch a worm as it crawls on the ground. See the sun as it shines through the star from the stars. Look at the earth that you live on and think about the waves of the ocean, the mountains and the beauty that God's made all around you and turn that thing off because it's sucking the very life out of your soul. Boy, you bad today. Are you mad at me? I'm trying to help you. You sit at night and you watch your comedies. These comedies, they call them. These sitcoms. These sitcoms. You're watching men kiss now. You're watching perverts as they join together on the TV screen in front of you. You're listening to stuff coming across a television set that you would have been embarrassed of 20 years ago. Your feet, that stuff's feeding you. It's coming into your heart and you wonder why you're bored in church on Sunday. You're brainwashed. You're like a zombie. You're walking around and your eyes and your mind are dead. And there's a world out here that God made and a creation that God upholds. By the word of his power, there's beauty. Beauty everywhere. You look into the face of a little child and see its excitement and watch the stars as they fly through its little eyes. And it is completely dependent upon you. It's vulnerable and it trusts you. 
And if you're a pervert and if you've been so brainwashed and you're a dead zombie, you don't even interact with these little children. They bother you. You want to spend your time back in front of the tube or this, 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 this. You see these kids all the time, five, six, ten kids. Here they are, they're walking down the street. They're not talking to each other. They've been robbed of life. That stinking thing you've got in your pocket is robbing you of your very life. That thing right there is robbing you of your life. Text messages and emails and all this stuff. You live day by day for that. Isn't that sad? When you could have God. Now let's talk a little bit about him here in Hebrews chapter number 11. You can reach him. And he's there for you. He longs to walk with you and talk with you. He longs to have communion and fellowship with you. He made you capable of fellowship and communion with him that an angel cannot have. A cherubim or a seraphim or none of these things. They can't walk where you can walk. And there's a blessedness and a glory that comes forth from the presence of God that's only for mankind, not for these things. Here are some of the things you see in Hebrews chapter number 11. In verse number 3, faith understands. Faith understands because it weighs all the facts and comes to a sane conclusion. There's something going on out here. Did you know what John Wayne said right before he died? John Wayne was no champion of the faith. And I don't know that John Wayne ever went to heaven. I don't know that John Wayne ever asked the Lord Jesus to come into his heart. But here's what John Wayne said before he died. He looked out there and he said, there's got to be a God out there because there's too much going on. There's a creation that I live in. How in the world could somebody be an atheist and have any sanity? That's John Wayne. Some of you kids in here today don't have any idea how big John Wayne was back in his day. John Wayne's what they called a superhero or a superstar in his day. But he was just a man like all the rest of us. He needed to be born again like all the rest of us. He needed to be saved. But he was no fool. When he came down to the end of his life, he died at 72 years of age with stomach cancer. John Wayne, 72. But before he died, he said, there's too much going on out here. There's too much out here. There's too much going on out here. So you style yourself an agnostic or an atheist. You say there is no God. And you like little children. I've watched atheists. They're like little children. They like to mock and make fun. They're not secure in what they believe because they don't believe anything. So the only way that they can relate to anything is to mock you, make fun of you, fight you, sue you because you want to put the Ten Commandments up. You want to pray at a ball game. They want to take that privilege away from you. The, you take a handful, just a little handful of loud-mouthed atheists, and they'll stop a whole football team from praying before the ball game. If I played football, I'd pray before I played. Because <laughs> you can get your neck broke out there on the good iron. But this little small handful of loud-mouthed atheists, why? That's what they live for. Because they got nothing inside. They're empty and they're dead. There's nothing in them. They got nothing to give you. Have you ever listened to what an atheist has to give you? He got nothing to give you, but I can give you something. I can tell you about Jesus. I can tell you about the one that can save you and forgive you of your sins and write your name in the Lamb Book of Life. I got something inside me they don't want anything about. All they can do is tear down, tear down, tear down, criticize and attack. Think about it for a moment, folks. The first, surest sign that somebody's lost the argument is when they no longer deal with the facts, they get into personality issues. You can always tell when someone has completely lost the debate because they can't deal with the facts. Now it becomes personal. That's what a lawyer does in the courtroom. If a lawyer goes into the courthouse and has a witness that he doesn't like and he knows that witness knows his stuff, he's not going to deal with the facts and the testimony of that witness. He's going to assassinate its character. That's the way they work. And that's the problem because they have nothing so that I better move along or we'd be here all day. Faith understands. Faith moves. Verse 7, Noah, the Bible said, moved with fear. That means it acts. It moves. It has a com compelling control of its life. If you have real Bible faith, it's going to affect the way you live. Don't you get tired of your hypocrisy? You say, preacher, you preach like that and you run half the people off. That's okay. I want you to hear the truth. Some of you get out of here and this afternoon you'll turn your television on, you'll plug into pornography and you'll sit there for two hours and you'll watch some of the filthiest garbage that ever came on the face of this earth. 
You'll sit there and feed your soul with pornography. And then you'll be so destructive and so critical of everybody else. And let me tell you something, boys. If your wife catches you watching pornography, that may go to the end of your marriage and destroy the whole thing. And do you know that they say that probably 40, 50 percent of the people that go to church are addicted to pornography? You want to know why there's no power? Do you want to know why? You know, do you want to know why on November the 10th or 11th, whenever they have the voting day, that you'll walk out of here and walk into a voting booth and you'll vote for a baby killer? You'll walk, you walk into a voting booth and you'll vote for somebody that promotes sodomy and perversion. You know why you're going to do it? Because that's the real you. That's the real you. That's the problem. Faith obeys in verse number eight. Abraham, the Bible said in verse number eight, by faith when he was called of God to go out, he obeyed. He obeys. If you have no Lord, you have no faith. If you're, only, if you're your own God and you're your own set of rules and circumstances and revelations and nobody's going to tell you what to do, you have no faith. You have no faith. The only way you can have any real faith is to have a Lord God Almighty. If you have a real Lord God Almighty, you've got faith. Because you look up and you bow your head before him and you say, Lord, you're my Lord God. How is it that you want me to live? How do you want me to live? How do you want me to witness and testify before people? What do you want me to do? Faith receives strength. Verse number 11. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Faith receives strength. She received strength to conceive a child. Faith receives strength from God. When all your friends walk out on you, kick you when you're down, stomp you when you're down, it's, he, it's when the Lord God comes to you when you need him in the worst. He'll be faithful to you at that worst time in your life. When everybody's turned from you, he'll come to you. It is that faith that receives strength. You'll receive strength from the Lord at a time like that. Little things that make all the difference in your life. It's not the bombastic and the, and the, and the rowdy and all of that stuff that makes a difference in your life. What makes a difference in your life is when you know the hand of God has been faithful in your life. He came to you when you needed him the worst. And all your friends forsook you, and then you found out what a friend was. How many ever been through anything in this old boy, in this old church, this church right here, ever been through something, and you found out you had a few friends in here? Raise your hand. And when you went through something in this church house, you went through something, you went through some hard time in your life, some lost a job, lost a wife, lost a husband, lost a child, lost your health, and you found out that the people that were your friends weren't the ones you thought were your friends. And the ones you thought were your friends weren't your friends. I went through a time when they started sniping at me. <laughs> the preachers took snipes, they took bites. It took a little shot here, and a little low shot there, a little, a little cheap shot over here. You don't forget those things. It doesn't matter. I'm not preaching for them. Amen. I'm preaching for Jesus. Amen. Because when they put me on the gurney and rolled me back into the room, and I said goodbye and kissed everybody goodbye, do you know who went with me? I'll tell you who went with me. He was the same one that was with me when I woke up. Verse number 17, faith is tried. Notice what it said, by faith Abraham when he was tried, offered up Isaac and he received the promises, offered up his only begotten son. Faith will always be tried. He didn't try it for him, for him to know what kind of faith you have. The trial's for you. You've prayed and said, Lord God, I don't know if I really believe. I don't know if my faith is real. I just don't know. God says, I'll take care of that. It'll be all right. You'll find out because I'll try your faith. And the apostle Peter said, the trying of your faith is much more precious than of gold that perisheth. If it's real faith, it'll stand the test of fire. Real gold does and real faith does. The only way that you can purify real gold is by fire. Put it in the heat. Turn up the heat. Boil the impurities away and let the gold separate. In plain words, it gets purer under the heat. It's more beautiful because the more impurities that you take out of gold, the 
more beautiful than it is. That's why it's used as a type of deity. Did you know that you can take gold? And I don't know if there's anything else like gold on this earth, but how many ever heard of gold leaf? You can beat gold so thin that you can literally see through it. Try that with steel, lead. Try it with anything. But you can grind it and beat it and press it and heat it. And all you've done is reveal the marvelous quality of gold. This is why men fight for gold. This is why they kill for gold. This is why gold to this very day, right now I think it's what, $1,400 an ounce, $1,600 an ounce? I don't know what the latest price was. But which is you to have, a pile of reserve notes or a pile of gold? <laughs> we can print you all the Federal Reserve notes you want. Or had you rather have the equivalent in gold? Long after the nation that printed that, that currency is gone from the face of the earth, that gold will still be here. That's faith. That's the way faith is. If you have real faith, that faith will stick with you. It'll stay with you because it's real faith. And God wants you to know it. He wants you to know you don't follow him with all this junk you got in your head. It's not a bunch of intellectual robots and Ottomans that follow the Lord. It's somebody that's got something burning in their soul. Real faith. And the thing about faith is it can grow and it become purer and purer, stronger and stronger. And the stronger it becomes and the purer it becomes, the greater it becomes. And the more it begins to dominate your life until one day you begin to walk by faith and not by sight. And that takes a while, and you can't do anything about it. What you do is simply hold on to what you know. Embrace who you know. Trust the one you know. With what little bit that's in you, it may be so small that you can't even imagine it's there. But trust God with what you got in you. It will grow. It will grow. It will grow. It will grow. And so faith is tried. Faith blesses. Verse 21, the Bible says, By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed the sons of Joseph and worshiped leaning upon the top of his staff. Now, don't you notice Jacob? He's quite an object lesson because Jacob has distinct periods of his life. First, there's Jacob, the usurper, the schemer. We've all been there. I know Jacob real well. I look in the mirror, I see Jacob. I thank God that Jacob's been worked on since I got saved in 1973. The usurper, the schemer, then there's Jacob the fugitive who's running from his brother Esau. Then there is Jacob the duped because he met one just like him and they couldn't get along together. Maybe that's why your marriage won't work. The two of you are just alike. You got to chew on that one for a while. You both have to have your way. And neither one of you are ever wrong. And if she only knew as much as you do, or he only knew as much as you do, then your marriage would be a whole lot better off. If they could just understand your, superior, your innate superiority, how that you're better and greater. If they just realized the beauty that was within you, and if they only understood why you love yourself so much, it's because you're, you are very lovable. <laughs> There's so much about you to love. That's the greatest secret of life. If I could just learn how to fall in mad love with myself, my problems are over. I hear preachers say that all the time. That is my problem. That is my problem. And that's what's wrong with your marriage. Marriage is give and take. Yeah, I give and he takes. No, marriage is give and take. Marriage is working your marriage out. Well, we're not, our marriage is not like their marriage. Forget their marriage. Work your marriage out. Because you're not married to her. You're married to her. You're not married to him. You're married to him. Make your marriage work. So you got to work at that, preacher. Exactly. You got to work at it. But that's the problem. You got to make a marriage work. You'll find out after you've been married for a while, there'll be things about your marriage you don't like. You're going to find out you get married. I'm going to tell you right now, right off the bat, just learn this fast. 
you're going to find out that that girl you dated and fell in love with has altogether changed. <laughs> you're going to wonder who moved into her body. <laughs> Amen. And uh, same with the girl. This dashing, uh, romantic, lovable man that told me how beautiful I was every day. Now we're married and he hardly even gives me a grunt when he walks through the door. And his supper ready. That's all he's concerned about. And you say, what's wrong, preacher? I'm going to tell you something about the human nature. The human nature is such that if you are willing to compromise and work a little bit toward your marriage, you've got to be a real devil not to give in and respect that. Give and take. Work at your marriage. Work at it. And you'll be surprised how God will bless it. God Almighty, when he saved you and he took you into the family of God, did he, ever, did he put up with a bunch of junk out of you? How many said, believe he did? Did he put up with a bunch of garbage out of you? Is he still putting up with a bunch of garbage out of you? God's long-suffering to us. We're. He certainly is. So there was, he was duped. He found one just like himself. Uh, Jacob was fearful. He was running from Esau. Then Jacob was determined because he said, I got to have something from God and I'm not going to leave here until I get it. And then finally, Jacob, Jacob became the blesser. He blessed. He gave. Oh, how when I'm 67 years old, would I like to take a child and raise it again? How I would like to take one and raise it again. Amen. How I would like to begin to mold its mind younger Amen. and answer its doubts quicker and show it what the world is about when you're 67 years old. You've learned a little bit about life. We're all messed up. Grandparents ought to be parents. Amen. How many of you grandparents agree with me this morning? I see every one of them raise their hand. You say, well, I'm offended by that. Well, you're a grandparent. Yeah. Well, you're a grandparent. I've got decades of experience to look back on. Amen. I know what it's about, folks. I know how quickly children can change, too. All it takes is one teacher placed at a strategic point in school to sow a seed of doubt into the heart of that innocent, vulnerable child and change it from a child that is, that is, that is obedient, that's good-natured and sweet, into a living devil. All it takes is one seed of doubt, which doth work as a canker, as a cancer. No, Jacob became a blesser. Why did he bless? Because he'd been blessed. Jacob could give out wisdom now. He was old enough. Jacob could look at the sons, his grandchildren. He could look at his grandchildren and his children, and he could bless them because he'd been blessed. He could give some wisdom out. The prime minister of India you probably don't even know. Most folks in America don't. I watch the BBC all the time. You know why? Because you get 10 times the news with the BBC than you ever get from CBS, NBC, and ABC. And CBS has more news on it than ABC and NBC put together. But, but India just, just elected a new prime minister. The prime minister of India, they say, came up from the wrong side of the tracks. The other side of the tracks, he worked hard all of his life. He was born poor. But here's what they showed. They showed the Prime Minister of India bowing down before his mother who put her hand on top of his head and blessed him. His 90-year-old mother was respected and revered. It was that honor and respect that that culture shows to their elders, to their mothers and to their fathers that we don't have. We take our old people and we ship them off somewhere and get rid of them. They interfere with our lifestyle. We don't have time for them. We don't have time for babies. We abort them. We don't have time for our old folks. We get rid of them. We don't have time for them. Well, remember something that goes around, comes around. That's what they'll do to you when your time comes. There was a time in this country when people respected and honored the older folks. Their seniors, their adults, because they knew that that gray hair was an indication there was some wisdom in there, and they wanted to hear what they had to say. And that's been lost in America. It's been lost. 
Oh, how we've paid for it. We've paid for it because a boy asks a girl now to go to the prom. She doesn't go. He takes a knife out and stabs her in the neck with it. This woman goes to McDonald's and she orders, uh, orders some kind of a hamburger or something. And when it comes back to her, it doesn't have exactly what she wants on it. She jumps up and begins to scream, I'm going to kill all of you. She leaves and two hours later comes back and threatens to shoot everybody in there again because her hamburger wasn't right. We got a problem big time in this country. Faith sees the invisible. I love this. Verse 27. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Did you see that? Faith is able to see, comprehend, embrace that which your mind cannot embrace. God will lift you up into a place because of your faith that he can bless you that no other way can you reach there. You can't reach there by studying. You can't reach there by praying. You can't reach there by perseverance. But you can reach there if you'll simply lift up your head from whence you were hewn to the rock that you came out of. And in your mind, soul, in the soul, in your spirit, lift up yourself before God and say, Lord God, I don't want to and even need to understand. I just want to be as close to you as I can get. I want to be there in your presence. I want to be between the cherubim and the holy of holies. I want you because I need you, Lord. And how it's going to happen, I don't know, but I know it will happen because you said if I'll draw nigh to you, you'll draw nigh to me. And I'm going to take you at your word. I'm going to draw nigh to you. And there you do that and God Almighty will meet you in such a way that you'll know what I'm talking about in this house this morning. Right before I came in here this morning, I was sitting there watching some, some, uh, some Christian singers. I wanted to watch something good before I came to church. So this, this one girl was singing a Christian song. And my mother came over my mind. She flew right through my mind. My mother came into my mind. My mother came upon my mind and I, and I, I didn't expect this to happen to me. But when she, when she flew into my mind, I was thinking so strongly upon my mother and I said, Lord, ain't there a place for her too? <laughs> In their place for her. Amen. And the floodgates of heaven opened. I mean, the, the power of the Holy Spirit of God just began to move up in my soul. He filled me up with the Holy Ghost and I started bawling down there. I mean, I was weeping all over the place. I didn't expect any of that to happen. But I felt the power of God come down and embrace me. And he said, son, there is a place for her too. My agnostic mother, my atheist mother, my mother that read everything she could get a hold of but the Bible. My mother that never said a word to me about Christ, that never did anything in front of me that would have led me to the Lord. In fact, she did stuff in front of me that God Almighty, you wouldn't have any idea what I'm talking about. And so I was raised with that and it burned in my soul and scarred me for my whole life. But there I sat and I said, Lord, isn't there a place for her too? She was dying with lung cancer. It wasn't her philosophers that she called on. No, buddy. It wasn't that crowd out there. You know who she called upon? She wanted her preacher son to come over there and pray with her. She wanted her preacher son. And I prayed with her. And I said, you can be saved. You can know the Lord. She said, pray with me. And I prayed with her. And she left this old world praying to the God that I pray to trusting in the Savior that I trust to. But you know how I am? I'm a skeptic. I'm a born skeptic. I mean, it's from the top of my head to the bottom. You try to ram something down my throat, you will beat your head against that wall. You're messing with the wrong person. I don't believe anything until the Holy Ghost begins to burn it in my heart. And for years I went after that and I thought, I don't know if it was real. I don't know if her faith is real. I don't know if she really believed. I don't know that what she was doing was simply because she's dying. You'll do anything if you think you're going to die. I thought I, that came across my mind time and time again. I had all that doubt in my soul, Lord, Lord, what am I, I, I you know, I want my mother to be in heaven, but I, I can't send her to heaven. And then this morning, and this woman was singing, she wasn't singing about my mother. <laughs> she wasn't singing about anything that I thought in my mind would even relate to her, but it just came. It just came. It was God in His time choosing the time and the place 
to touch me, and I know the Holy Ghost. I know the Holy Ghost. And I just said, I said, Lord, is there a place for her? <laughs> I've preached a long time, folks. Wouldn't it be something to be get up here preaching to you week in, week out, my mother and father burning in hell? Wouldn't that be rough? Wouldn't that be rough? I don't even know how my daddy died. I have no idea how he died. I know he died in 1956. I was 10 years old. He must have been maybe, he was probably, uh, uh, he might have been 25, 25 to 30, somewhere in there. He was a World War II veteran. I've got a picture of him. I've got a picture of my mother and my aunt. My dad, I couldn't, I couldn't, I can tell, I can count on one hand the times I've seen him. I had no idea how he died. Have no idea. But I know his daddy, my grandfather, came home one day. And my grandfather was an unbeliever. But he came home one day and he said, I've gotten saved. And this family's going to church. Yeah. And my dad started going to church. And then there was a day that my dad, my aunt told me this, my, his sister, my aunt said, you know that your dad announced his calling to preach. I said, God wanted him to preach. I said, no, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I said, yes, God wanted him to preach. I said, well, I'm glad to hear that. That means there must be something serious going on here. But he never did. He never did. He went through a divorce with my mother. They were separated. It drove him to the bottle. That's the only way he could handle it, stay drunk. And that's, that, that dulled the sense of it, what he was going through. He, he went to the bottle, and it wasn't long before, after that that he died. He died in his 20s. He died in his 20s. So I believe that they'll come when I'll see my dad. And I'll see him in heaven. So what makes you think that? Because he died young. He died young because he had rebelled against the call from God. Yeah. He died young. He died young. He rebelled against that call. There was a day when he shouted and rejoiced and praised God. There's a man that used to come to this church that used to go out of town and stand on the street corner and preach the Word of God and hand out tracts and witness for the saving grace of God. Faithful, love the Lord, went all the time to give God's Word out. He won't walk into a church house today. He won't darken a church door today. Do you know what I do? Every day when I get down in that closet and shut that door, I say, Lord, you remember he used to preach for you? I said, he used to be faithful, Lord. You know that. He loved you, Lord. Now, I don't know what happened to him. I don't know what, where his foundation was destroyed. I don't know what happened to him. But he used to preach for you, and he loved you, and he served you with all of his heart, and he just could not handle what he got into. Lord, remember him. That's what I'm praying. That's what Samuel used to pray about Saul. You remember that? Samuel took Saul before the Lord week, day in and day out because Samuel had anointed him. I had much rather be there 10,000 times there than to be this crowd that takes a sledgehammer and drives you on down when you're broken, kicks you when you're down, stomps you and uses you for fodder for their cannons. No, no, no. Make me a, a restorer, a builder of the breach. Make me one that helps you. Make me one that will come to you and help you when you're down. When everybody else has kicked you out, you wind up selling your body. Some of you girls in here will go through a divorce. You had no idea you'd ever go through a divorce like that. You wind up out here on the street and wind up as a prostitute. Say, God would never take me back. Oh, yeah, he would. Oh, yes, he would. And I'm going to tell you something else, too. If you ever wind up out there on the street selling your body, God will raise up somebody to come out there and talk to you one day and help you and get you back. Don't ever boast in what you think you're going to do. Don't ever do it. Faith, I have faith in him. I believe him. If I lose my mind and go screaming mad, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. I've got faith in him. I'm going to close with this. I've got saving faith. Saving faith. You hear this pumped out, this garbage pumped out from Washington, D.C., day in and day out. Faith community, that doesn't mean anything. A Buddhist has faith. A Mohammedan has faith. 
What are you talking about, faith community? That doesn't mean, that's meaningless. That doesn't mean a thing. I have faith in my Lord Jesus Christ. Do you ever have saving faith? Has it ever really happened to you? John Wayne died with stomach cancer. He was 72. Whether he died in saving faith or not between him and God, I don't know. I have no idea. The one thing I can say for John Wayne, he was no fool. He did not stand up and say there is no God. If you believe there is no God, you're a fool. Well, I believe in God. That doesn't mean anything. That just shows you're not a fool. What do you mean? I thought it was all about believing in God. No, it's believing in God through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way you can be born again. You've got to have the Son. Well, I believe He lived. I believe He existed and all that. That really doesn't mean anything either. So what am I supposed to believe then, preacher? You're supposed to take Him and embrace Him. Take hold of Him and receive Him. Clutch Him, take hold of Him, wherever your heart does it. And say, Lord Jesus, I'm a lost, hell-bound sinner. I deserve the pit, and there's no way I'm going to stay out of there but by Thee. Save me, Lord Jesus. Save me. Be my Savior. Be my Savior. That will get you saved Amen. if that comes from the heart. But it's got to come from the heart. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray you'd use what I've said this morning, Lord.